Hi, my name's Gideon Cordova. This is My Two Cents Adjusted for Inflation. Thanks for joining me on this sweltering hot summer's day right at the end of the year. I thought we would cap off this year by explaining one of the most important aspects of modern monetary theory, and that is the, the notion of a job guarantee. A federally funded, locally administered job guarantee where anybody who wants a job can get one. You'll also hear this notion discussed as an employer of last resort program or as buffer stock employment or indeed a transitional job guarantee. There is an extensive academic literature that exists and I highly recommend that you treat this video as just a cursory overview of what the proposal is and then investigate further research. Check out the links in the video description below, particularly check out the work of Professor Bill Mitchell and Dr Quirk from the University of Newcastle where you can receive answers to some of those more specific questions about the implementation of a job guarantee. Questions like, will we be able to provide jobs for everyone? What kind of jobs will they be? What specific price should we set the job guarantee wage at? All of those questions have been thought about and developed in the academic literature. So it is worth going and investigating further. At its core, a job guarantee offers a job to anybody who is willing and able to work. Anybody who wants a job anywhere in the country would be able to get a job. It's a permanent fixture of public policy, so it's not something that you just implement in, in hard times and then get rid of in the good times. It acts as an inflation anchor and works in a macroeconomic sense to smooth out the business cycle and to stabilise the business cycle. And that's why it's fundamentally important, just like things like Medicare or our public health service, we don't withdraw those in the good times and then only implement them in the bad times. We have them as permanent fixtures of our civilization, and that helps create a, a, a more beneficial society for everyone, for everyone to enjoy, and it increases our quality of life. So too with the universal, federally funded, locally administered job guarantee. The story begins by first understanding the supply demand price mechanism. So a few years ago in Queensland, there was a big hurricane and it wiped out the banana crop in Queensland. There are a scant few bananas still available from farms in New South Wales, but the vast majority of the banana crop that year was decimated. As a result, with such low supply of bananas, but still a high demand for bananas, as you can imagine, the price of bananas exploded. Obviously, the, the inverse or the converse of that can happen, where if there were too many bananas in the crop that year and they flooded the market with bananas, the price of the bananas would drop. Well, the same dynamic, the same price mechanism exists in the labour market. When there's lots and lots of unemployed people bashing on the door asking for a job, obviously the employer can pay whatever they want. They don't have to increase wages. They certainly don't have to pay a high wage. If there's heaps of unemployed people, then the price of labour drops. On the other hand, if there aren't many unemployed people available for the private sector to hire, well then the price of labour increases. So the idea behind the buffer stock was explained by Professor Bill Mitchell. He tells the story that in 1978 he was in fourth year at university and he was studying the Australian wool price stabilisation scheme. All around the country to this day you can see these old red brick buildings and they, they're called the wool store. Most of them are hotels and things like that now. but. The wool store was where the Australian government would help stabilise the price of wool with, with the following mechanism. Let's say that in a year the clip, the wool clip, was very, very good. So there was heaps of excess wool supply. Normally that would drive down the price of wool, which would be bad for the farmers. So in order to stabilise that price explosion, the government would step in and purchase all of the excess wool and they'd pop it in the wool store. Then in a bad year when the clip was very poor, rather than letting the price of wool explode because of such low supply, the government would instead sell some of that excess wool that they had in the wool store and it would stabilise the price. These buffer stocks have been used all over the world with various different crops and things like that. We've done it with wheat, we've done it with wool, we've done it with corn. Indeed, when we were on a gold standard, when the economy functioned with the Bretton Woods system of currency convertibility and the US dollar could be convertible into gold, that was in essence the full employment of gold. That was a gold buffer stock. There was never an, an occasion when there wasn't liquidity in the gold market. Even if they stopped making jewellery out of gold that year, or even if they didn't need gold for computers, you could still buy and sell gold all the time because it was fully employed. Right now, we have a buffer stock of unemployed people. Whenever the private sector wants to 
hire more unemployed people. They can reach into that pool of buffer stock, offer a low wage usually, and, and hire them out of the, the stock of unemployed people. The job guarantee proposal asks that instead of having a buffer stock of unemployed people, we create a buffer stock of employed people. Imagine if in the big wool stores they left all the doors open and let the rain get in and damage all of the wool stock. What good would that be? You don't want your buffer stock to get damaged or go mouldy or get destroyed or get stolen. Why, why would you want that? You want to keep your, your, stock, your buffer stock in as good healthy condition as possible. Well, all of the empirical evidence shows that unemployed people suffer so many negative social and health consequences as a result of their unemployment. Unemployed people have higher rates of suicide. They're more susceptible to all kinds of medical consequences. Here in Tasmania, we know that there's a, a direct correlation between areas with high levels of unemployment and also areas with high levels of heart disease. All kinds of intergenerational social consequences that are extremely negative and are tantamount or are abuses of the people's human rights who live in that area. If you live in an area that doesn't have access to good quality employment, your life expectancy is shorter, there's a greater propensity for drug and alcohol dependency, um, mental health problems, social isolation and dislocation, more crime, more domestic violence. It's, it's completely unfair that people are subjugated to, to these kinds of negative consequences simply because the private sector won't step in and employ people in those communities. And as a result of that lack of opportunity, they are foist on with all kinds of horrendous and intergenerational harm. And I think that's unfair and I think that's an abuse of their human rights. And as a result, in order to simply scrape by, you then have to go on our punitive social welfare system, which doesn't provide adequate income to, to sustain a, a dignified quality of life. It excludes you in a social sense from the rest of the community because you can't participate in the community. You can't go to social functions. You can't afford public transport. You can't afford healthy food. All these kinds of additional pernicious assaults on a human being's sense of inclusion, dignity and well-being. All of this takes place as a result of lack of employment opportunities. So just like the wool store made sure that it kept its wool in good condition, we as a nation need to make sure that the people, who the labour force, who the private sector currently doesn't want to hire, we need to make sure that they are kept equally in good condition. And that means dignified circumstance with access to a decent paying job with decent benefits. So the process of the job guarantee works as follows. Even though it's federally funded, it is locally administered, which means that rather than having to travel an hour and a half to flip burgers in the CBD, you can get a job in your local community doing something that helps the public purpose. I really recommend you read Dr. Quirk and Professor Bill Mitchell's very extensive work on the topic, and you can find that link in the video description below. The job guarantee does not compete with the private sector. It simply acts as a transitional job so that if the private sector doesn't want to hire a particular unemployed group of people, then the job guarantee offers them the job. If you rock up to the public job late or drunk or you start fights, of course you can get fired in just the same way you can get fired in the private sector and currently if you have a public sector job you can, you can get fired if you don't participate in the correct way. You can still be punished if you set fire to the Centrelink office, then you won't get your Centrelink payments. So too, in the job guarantee system, if you abuse the, the, the job guarantee job, then, then you're no longer permitted to participate. We, we should remember that the private sector has only ever managed to employ about 77% of the Australian workforce at any time. Three in four. There's always one in four people who the private sector won't employ. Throughout our history, sometimes the public sector, the government, has employed the slack in the labour force, like we had several decades with full employment, and that was because even though the private sector was only hiring three out of every four people who wanted jobs, the public sector would step in. Now the public sector doesn't step in as much as they did before, and as a result we have this huge slack in the labour market. Another very important aspect of the job guarantee is its function as an inflation anchor. So it works to smooth out the business cycle. It stabilizes the business cycle and it does it in the following way. By having a job guarantee where whether you're a doctor or a, or, um, a musician, you know that 
If you can't get employed in the private sector, you can enter the public sector and be paid a base wage. Well, that then becomes the anchor below which consumer demand cannot fall in the economy. And it also provides a new functional minimum wage for the economy. Right now, we ostensibly have a minimum wage in Australia, but it's only a minimum wage if you can find employment. If you live in Daniloquin or, or in Franklin in Tasmania or in um, Horsham or Arnhem Land and there are no jobs available, you don't get the minimum wage. You get Centrelink, which is below the minimum wage. And you, you're not offered a job. So functionally, the minimum wage there, if there are no jobs available, is zero. Once we set a job guarantee wage where anybody who wants a job for as many hours, as, as many or as few hours as they want, if they just want to work part-time or if they want to work full-time, we offer a job to anybody, anywhere, who wants one. Once we do that, then there will be it will change the minimum point at which consumer demand can can drop below. It will set a floor in the economy below which the economy cannot cannot drop. So it it serves to anchor the price of the Australian dollar to labour. For ease of mathematics, let's say that we set the minimum job guarantee wage to sixty dollars per hour. Well, that means that one minute is worth one Australian dollar. So right now, since we've had fiat currencies for which there's an infinite supply, you can never run out of fiat currency, the question then becomes, what is the value of a fiat currency? Well, the value is relative to all of the other currencies in the world. How many American cars do we take in versus how much wool do we export versus how much um, uh, Japanese computers we bring in versus how many um, consultants we export. Our dollar floats on the foreign exchange markets and its value is relative to all of the other, all of the other currencies around the world. But what is its actual value? Well, it's very hard to measure. By setting a minimum job guarantee wage, we then know that the currency is worth a certain amount of labor hours. So it acts as, a, as, a, as an inflation anchor. If we decide to set the, the job guarantee wage quite high above the current minimum wage, then indeed some corporations that are currently paying below poverty wages might have to readjust. And if they can't, readjust, then they might have to exit the economy. But that's no bad thing when you have some employers who are deliberately exploiting the population and paying them poverty wages in this country. If you think about it in the United States, for example, Walmart, a lot of Walmart's staff and employees have to be on food stamps. They're not paid enough money to be able to survive, so they need to receive government social welfare. And that's to the tune of about $153 billion in the US. It's so much that Walmart itself, which only pays about $6 billion per year in taxes, they receive, the employees of Walmart, receive $6.2 billion US dollars in social security welfare payments to supplement their low income. So they're on food stamps. Even though they work, they can't get enough money to sustain themselves. Well, by the government providing the money, as a supplement to their low income. They're essentially providing a freebie to the corporation who doesn't have to pay that, that extra salary. If we in Australia set the minimum wage floor for the job guarantee to, to a certain amount that's higher than it currently is today, whatever the specific is, is a political choice. But if we set it higher than it currently is, then we can set the, the lowest reasonable quality of life that we expect for a working Australian to have. It's important to know that this job guarantee proposal doesn't compete with the private sector. Currently, all the unemployed people in Australia, their, their value in the labour market is, is essentially zero. The private sector is not bidding for them. So simply by employing all the currently unemployed people for whom the private sector currently does not want, that is not, as a, that is not in competition with the private sector. It's simply, it's simply employing people who, who the private sector hasn't bid for yet. So their bid price at the moment is, is zero. The private sector doesn't want them. If they did want them, they would have hired them. Now, all the way through Australian history, on average, the private sector has only managed to employ about 77% of the population. So even in the best of times, the private sector has only employed three out of every four people in the labour force. Now, during the era of full employment, indeed, the, the public sector was hiring more people, and so we only had 2% unemployment. And today we have maybe five or six percent unemployment so the public the, the government has been employing fewer people but the private sector has never never been able to employ everybody that wants a job so again 
think back to that buffer stock, rather than having a buffer stock of unemployed people with all of these intergenerational social consequences, all of the increased hardship and suffering, all of the human rights abuses that take place as a result of not having a job, why can't we just immediately reverse that? The other important aspect of a job guarantee is that it changes the employer-employee relationship that currently exists when employers, the people who are hiring staff, they can use the threat of unemployment to discipline the wage demands of their workers. So when there's a million people knocking on work on the on the door of, of employers saying, please give me a job, that means that the bosses don't have to acquiesce to the demands of the people who are currently employed to give them a pay rise. And we can see that in the era of full employment in Australia, productivity was in line with wage growth. As in, with every increase in productivity per hour for Australian workers, there was an equal increase in the wage per hour of the average Australian worker. Since the 1970s and 80s, that started to diverge and it continues to diverge. And that gap that you see between the lines is, it's the distribution of national wealth to profits and away from wages. Now, with things like a universal basic income, that dynamic, that exploitative dynamic, will not be shifted one iota. But with a job guarantee, if somebody is being exploited, or if somebody isn't being given a decent pay rise, then they can always just get up and leave. They can go and find employment elsewhere. They'll be able to receive a decent wage with decent benefits in the public sector. And that's going to mean that a lot of employers are going to have to be much more fair when it comes to giving a fair share of the increase in productivity to wages. So we'll start to see wage growth increase in Australia once more. If we set the minimum wage for a job guarantee higher than the current minimum wage, well that's no bad thing. If some of the big employers, McDonald's and Woolworths, they might scream and cry and, and whinge that they're not able to operate their business like that, but the reality is you shouldn't be operating by exploiting your workers. If you can't run your business without exploiting your workers, without making your employees work but not be able to provide for themselves and their family, then you shouldn't be in the economy. You're not good enough. That's not, a, that's not an efficient market. It's not a decent civilised society. Unemployment dwarfs all of the other microeconomic efficiencies that economists and politicians and business leaders spend their time worrying about. In a, in a shop they might say, well we have two staff who are currently working at the, at the coffee machine but they should be over at uh, standing by the fridge. That's a, a microeconomic inefficiency. That is so much less wasteful than the million people who are currently unemployed. You will never get their productivity back. Those, those days and hours of potential productivity that is lost is, is a failure of, of an economic system. Right now, Australia's capacity utilisation is at about 81%, which is the equivalent of the equivalent of having five factories and five trucks and only using four of the factories and four of the trucks. But more importantly, let's look at the human cost of that, that we have 1.8 million people who want more work or just want some work and are not getting it. Those people, we are losing their potential. We are losing the, the offering that they would give to society if we simply offered them a job. The way that James Tobin put it was to ask, how many Harberger triangles can fit into one Oakham gap? And the answer is lots. A Harberger triangle is an assessment of one of these microeconomic inefficiencies, and the Oakham gap is a description of, of the macroeconomic inefficiency th that can be caused by mass unemployment. So the, the quote that I, that I like is, as, as the, the late James Tobin used to say, it takes a lot of Harberger triangles to fill an Oakham gap. A more general observation that even bad microeconomic policies which lead to substantial distortions in the use of resources, they have a hard time doing remotely as much damage as a severe economic slump, which doesn't just misallocate resources, it simply wastes them. So we can worry all we want about the misallocation of resources, putting one resource here when it should be put over there, but that pales in comparison to the massive economic wastage of not employing the unemployed. One of the amazing transformational things about the Job Guarantee Program, not only does it regenerate rural, remote and, and outer suburban communities because it lets people work close to home on, on projects that, that improve their local area, but it also redefines what work is. Currently, we, 
the private sector is much more willing to pay somebody to speculate on a on a, a financial transaction. So, so essentially gambling, they're, they're willing to pay very high salaries for that, but not willing to pay very high salaries for, say, childcare or educating the next generation of, of our future workers. They're not interested in in taking care of national parks or providing. A, uh, you know, regenerating the, the community to make it uh, more environmentally friendly, easier to use public transport, to walk or to cycle. They're not interested in doing that. There's no profit motive in that. But they are interested in, in paying people to do fundamentally useless things like speculation on, on, on financial transactions. And it's funny to me that a lot of people who have criticised the job guarantee have used the argument that it would be difficult to find uh, work for all of these millions of people, they just end up doing something useless or, or boondoggling. Well, it's funny that it, it appears that people are very concerned about public sector uh, wastage of labour, but they're not very concerned about private sector wastage. So there are plenty of jobs that the private sector employs people to do, which are fundamentally harmful to the economy, fundamentally harmful to the society. And yet we're very thankful when, when the private sector deigns to employ a new cashier at at uh, the local supermarket or deigns to employ a, a new staff member for a fast food chain. Even though a lot of this work could be automated, we're very thankful when the private sector does create these fundamentally bad jobs. But if the public sector creates one bad job, well, people are up in arms about it. So there's a bit of inconsistency there. Some people have wondered whether or not by providing a a job guarantee, it disincentivizes people to work hard. If they could get a job elsewhere, why would they bother showing up on time or working hard? Well, this proposal specifically says that anything that the private sector can legally do to their employees, so too can they in the public sector. So if you rock up late, if you don't show up, if you show up drunk, if you get into fights, of course you can still be fired in exactly the same way at Centrelink. If you set fire to the Centrelink office, then you won't receive your payments. Well, that works right now and so too would it work under a job guarantee system. They often talk at Centrelink about the idea of reciprocal responsibility or, or mutual or a mutual responsibility. Well they're not lifting their end of the bargain. They're giving you a pittance below poverty below poverty income but they do nothing to provide you with the opportunity to get a job. It's fundamentally punitive and particularly well particularly for minorities and vulnerable people for the indigenous community, in rural, people in rural and regional areas, it is absolutely abhorrent the way that they are treated. In all kinds of ways, the, the, it's unfair and it's punitive, the current system that exists, and it is damaging the future productivity of the nation. Whereas if we employed all of those people, anybody who wants a job and can work could get one, we would be a far more productive society, but we'd also be a far more inclusive society. So let's now look at a universal basic income. I personally think that you can have a universal basic income and we should have one and it should be in concert in addition to a job guarantee, but it shouldn't be instead of a job guarantee and it shouldn't be a standalone universal basic income. And there are a number of reasons for this that I'd like to outline now. Firstly, society is currently being torn apart by rampant economic inequality. There is a massive income inequality. The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. Universal basic income, by giving $20,000 to me, but also $20,000 to Gina Reinhardt and Clive Palmer, that will do nothing to diminish the, the current income inequality that exists in Australia. In addition to that, I see that there is currently a fundamentally exploitative relationship between corporate elites and the workers in Australia. We can see that in the days of full employment, as productivity went up, so too did wages. But over the last few decades, there's been this massive divergence where wages haven't grown even though productivity has. And the reason for that is that there's a massive pool of unemployed people who are begging for work, pleading for work, and because they are constantly at the door and would take a job if they were offered one, that means that when somebody who is currently employed asks for a pay rise, the boss knows that they don't have to give it to them. They don't have to because they can immediately hire somebody else from the, the pool of unemployed people uh, without, without having to 
increase anybody's wages. So right now there is a dynamic that exists, an exploitative dynamic between the, the bosses and the workers, and that is that the, the bosses are able to discipline the wage demands of workers. They're able to discipline them with the threat of unemployment. So they don't have to say yes to a, a pay rise because they know that they could immediately hire somebody else. And again, the universal basic income doesn't do anything to remedy that fundamentally exploitative relationship that currently exists. Whereas with a job guarantee, if you weren't being provided with a decent wage increase, you, you could leave that particular employer knowing that you could immediately get a transitional job in the job guarantee pool so you could maintain your skills, maintain your social networks, maintain a decent income with benefits whilst looking for, for a new job. Now you could try and claim that the current Centrelink system offers you that, but it absolutely doesn't. Centrelink wages haven't increased since 1994 in real terms. They're 40% below the poverty line. People who have a mortgage, who have a family, people who have responsibilities and a certain quality of life are, are so threatened by the notion of having to enter into that fundamentally humiliating and punitive system that they are willing to take the abuse of employers because they simply can't afford to lose that job. So if we can unravel that dynamic, it will be a fundamentally positive thing for the nation. It will be a more inclusive society. It will be a society where the workers enjoy wage increases in line with productivity once more. And the universal basic income simply doesn't provide that. So you have to be a bit suspicious when the uber wealthy and and the CEOs like Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk and Richard Branson, they, they are supportive of a universal basic income, a standalone universal basic income. And many of these very rich, particularly conservative people, think that a universal basic income should scale back. Once you implement the UBI, they will then scale back social welfare programs. So you would get the UBI, but in return, you don't get any more Centrelink and you don't get public health insurance. So we have to be very careful that by letting a UBI come at the expense of our current social safety net, we will be inadvertently undoing 60 years of hard work to get a minimum standard of living in this country. So if you want a, a to campaign for something like that, it shouldn't be a universal basic income, but it should be a universal basic quality of life. The universal basic income treats people as a consumption unit. It assumes that if you just give people a certain stipend, twenty or thirty thousand dollars per year, that that will be tantamount to social inclusion. It isn't. Human beings are more than just units for purchasing more goods and services. They actually have value, they have worth, they have the need to feel included, the need to feel important, the need to feel like they're a, a part of a community. That's what makes for a robust, well-functioning, happy society. It isn't simply enough to just pay people a stipend and then leave them and then leave them isolated with no chance of career progression, with no chance of uh, education, on-the-job work experience, with no chance of getting ahead and creating a better life. All you're doing is entrenching the same poverty cycle that we have right now. We can see from the studies that have been done of the Argentinian Jefes Head of Household Job Guarantee Program that when they asked people, what do you value most about the job? Is it the income? Income was not the most important thing. What was the most important thing was feeling like you can, you can help, feeling like you're participating in something that's positive and beneficial for the community. People like to be altruistic. People like to meet new people and have friends and, and develop a, a network and to feel like they're a part of something. People like that. So I don't see how a universal basic income on its own without a job guarantee, I don't see how that will refurbish uh, derelict communities in, in geographically isolated areas. I think it will just perpetuate the problem of social stigma, of social dislocation, isolation, and, and the negative intergenerational consequences that are associated with that. Now, if you're in a rural area, a regional area, an outer suburb, there are very few job opportunities available. So there's very little chance of being able to get onto a career path to receive career development, education, work experience, on-the-job training. You simply can't get that if you live in Deniloquin or if you live in Arnhem Land. It's not available to you. Here in rural Tasmania, there simply aren't job opportunities available to you. So 
a universal basic income, while it's all very nice for the first couple of weeks to, to know that you have that, that extra cash, you're still no better placed in society. You, you still don't have those social networks. You, don't, you still have that stigma of being an unemployed person. And as time goes by and the relative prices increase in comparison with your universal basic income, you'll be in exactly the same situation as people currently are on Centrelink payments, which haven't increased since 1994 in real terms. So if you set the UBI at, say, 20000 a year, and the prices increase all around because, of course, productivity hasn't increased, very soon it will be just a, a tokenistic trivial sum. You, you won't be able to survive on it anyway. And what we've seen from Centrelink is that there's a reticence amongst policymakers, politicians, economists and business leaders. There's a reticence to, to increase the Centrelink income. And that's why it's remained the same since 1994. People don't want to give other people money for not doing anything. And as a result, it's been whittled away and whittled away to such an extent that it's functionally useless now. And you see people living below poverty in undignified circumstances in contravention of their their rights as human beings they have their human rights impinged upon by a social safety net that hasn't kept pace with the actual cost of living and the universal basic income is exactly the same if you don't increase the goods and services available to a community in line with the increase in the amount of money that people have available to spend if there aren't enough goods on the shelf for them to purchase the price of everything will simply go up. We saw these price adjustments occur, for instance, when the GST was implemented. M most prices went up by about 10%. When there was a solar panel rebate, um, let's say it was about $5,000, you saw, you saw very quickly that on average, the cost of getting your house retrofitted with solar panels went up by about $5,000 in line with that subsidy. You see the same thing with the first homeowners grant, which should really be called a first home lenders grant because you get the $20,000 home, first home builders grant and you immediately give it straight to a bank anyway, so it should be called the home lenders grant. But when they implemented a $20,000 first home builders grant, immediately the cost of building a home, because the construction companies all knew that everybody had this grant, you saw the average price of, of con house construction go up by about the same amount. So there's there's a real risk that if you don't increase the productivity of the nation, but you just give everybody this, this payment, that on aggregate prices will go up by that amount. And unless you keep increasing the amount of the universal basic income, unless you index it to match the inflation that's occurring, well, people's relative purchasing power will be diminished until, they, until it's, it's hardly worth having anyway. But of course, what we're describing here is the beginnings of an inflationary spiral. If you set the UBI at 20,000, but then the relative value of that money diminishes, so you have to increase it to 30,000 in five years time, and then 40,000 and then 50,000, obviously all of the prices are going up around you, that's inflation. So I think we have to be very careful about the notion of implementing a UBI unless it is in conjunction with a, a, a federally funded, locally administered job guarantee as a permanent fixture in the Australian economy. Please read more about the job guarantee in the links below and also do your own research. There's so much information available from the um, Centre for Full Employment and Equity at the University of Newcastle and Professor Bill Mitchell's blog, so I really encourage you to, to follow that up. Thanks very much for joining me and I wish you a happy new year. Bye for now.